All right, good. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Um, I do believe when it comes to this technology, I'm special ed. You guys have to really be <laughs> have to be uh, patient with me. Um, it's good to be with y'all today. One quick word that I just I think I believe God laid on my heart. Um, as Hannah was saying about when you're together for all your activities, maybe having a little word of prayer together, and there's power in that. And I'm reminded of the simple fact, Hannah, that um, anytime God moved in a great way in the New Testament, the people were together. So there's something cool about that. You know, we should be praying in our own closets, like Jesus said. We should be doing that. And prayer shouldn't be a time where one person gets up and, you know, has a spotlight on them, you know, and has many words and all that, that teaching. Um, but I also know that when God's people were together, uh, that's when the Lord did some pretty special stuff. So um, I think it's a good word, Hannah. I think encouragement to all of us when we're together as Christians is we got things we do, but sometimes I think we get so busy doing the things we want to do, the checklist, we forget about being in Christ and with Christ and being family, um, and, and we kind of lose um, that relationship with the one we're doing all this stuff for in the first place. So it kind of helps um, calibrate us a little bit. So that's a good word. Um, it is so good being with you all today. Uh, we're going to look at some final words from Paul. We're wrapping up the book of Colossians. I don't know about you all, but I've only preached several sermons from this whole book, and I've enjoyed the book of Colossians. I hope you guys have been blessed and encouraged as we've gone through this book. Um, I find myself every time I preach from a book and I take a book, I, I tend to say this is one of my favorite books in the Bible. And I say that about every book I preach uh, because God's Word is just so amazing. I go through it and I'm like, oh my, this is one of my favorites. And people say, you said that about this book and this book and that book. Um, but Colossians is a, is a glorious book. I, I hope you've been blessed. And it's been a joy for Leslie and me to be with you all at Second Baptist. Leslie's not here today. Um, she kind of um, outdid herself a wee bit yesterday on a couple things. She woke up with a massive migraine, and uh, so she's kind of out of commission right now. Um, but uh, I do know that she would be here if she could. But we've been blessed by hanging out with you. So thank you for hosting us and letting us be part of your family uh, in an extended way. Uh, remember, just real quickly, as we kind of do a little quick background and, and kind of bring us up to speed, remember, Colossians is much like the book of Ephesians. In the fact that the first half of the book, Paul spends the time to lay a theological foundation. And then the second half, he in essence says, all right, since all of this is true, then how shall we live? What does that mean to us? It's great if you believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven, but what does that mean to you as you live your life? And so, so Paul kind of gets into this, and so in Colossians, the first couple chapters, he is focusing on the supremacy of Christ. Christ is the head of the church and the head of all, that we've died with Christ and in Christ and no longer in bondage to the world and the world's regulations and even dead religion. We have been set free, and Jesus is now the head of our church and the head of our lives, and so now... What does that mean for us as we live out those lives? Paul gives some instructions. He tells us our focus earlier in chapter 3 should be set on things above. Our personal impact, he talks about how we should put off the old life and put on the new life, especially um, of love and forgiveness and peace and mercy. And then he talks about the relational impact of Jesus being supreme, how we live in front of others and our relationships with our family and at work. And so he, he plays this all out in a practical way. And so today we're going to conclude with a few more instructions that he gives. So uh, let's go through this, listen together. Under the supremacy of Christ and how he impacts every area of our lives and the life of the church, Paul says, I want you to do these last few things for me. All right, I got, I got, some, I got some stuff I want to ask you to do. And so I want to apply that here. Do you all believe that God's word is still as relevant today as it was when it was first written? Amen. Amen, right? And so when Paul says, hey, church, because Christ is supreme and he's our head, this is what I want you all to do. This is how we, it should look. I think we can preach. I know we can preach the same message today to the church, the church at Second Baptist, the church at Cumberland. We, we, we can say, look, because he's the head, because he is supreme, this is what it means to us as we live out our lives. 
So if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 18. I'm going to ask you if you would, just for a moment, if you're able to, to stand with me. We're going to read God's Word together. I think it's up there. Cool. Um, is, it, is it the NIV? Did you get the... I don't want us to read the same thing or not. I don't want us to read. I hope. Maybe. Yeah. Oh, good. Thank you, sir. All right. If y'all would stand with me, please, those who can, and we will read together um, as you're able to. Uh, when we get to verses like um, 7 and on, there's some funny names so if you're not sure about those names, just go, mm, you know, we'll just keep right on going right past it, okay? Uh, but we'll, we'll get to it together, okay? All right, let's start. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. He is coming with Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother, who is one of you. They will tell you everything that is happening here. My fellow prisoner, Aristarchus, sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You have received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my co-workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. Epaphras, who was one of you, and a servant of Christ Jesus sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. I vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those at Laodicea and Hierapolis. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor, and Demas send greetings. Give my greetings to the brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. After this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. Tell Archippus, see to it that you complete the ministry you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. God, I pray today that you would cause us to hear your voice, understanding that your word never comes back void. Father, I pray to remind us that Stephen Carr is not the teacher today. Ultimately, it is your spirit who teaches us. So I pray you would give us open ears to him. And that you would, uh, he would fulfill what he was sent here to do. And you said that when he comes, he will guide us into all truth. So I pray you would open our hearts and minds today and transform us by your word in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks, y'all may be seated today. It is a joy to be here again. Let's run through this together. We're going to look at three basic things that Paul says I want y'all to do. He didn't say y'all. I know he wasn't from the south, and he's from southern Jerusalem. But, you know, uh, uh, there's three things I want you to do, uh, and we're going to go through them together. One is be intentional in prayer. Two, build bridges with the lost. Three, bless yourself with Christian friends. Now, I want y'all to know that these are three things that Paul says to the church of Colossae, and he also wants it read at the church of Laodicea. And I believe if he knew about the church at Second Baptist, he would say, make sure those at Second Baptist hear this too. All right? And so uh, let's look at those three things and break them down together. First of all, be intentional in prayer. 
Verses 2 to 4, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Evidently, the people of Colossae, were, they, they prayed. Um, they were prayers. How many of y'all pray? Y'all pray? Amen. How many of y'all think your prayer life could be a lot more focused and a lot more intentional? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I do think this, this is what Paul's dealing with. Paul, Paul is not putting them down for not praying. He's not saying, oh, you guys don't pray, and somehow your prayer life lacks. He's saying, let me give you some helpful coaching tips in your prayer. Okay? So, so first of all, he says, um, um, well, he wants them to not be unintentional or disorganized or, or haphazard. He wants them to focus in. So he uses three terms here when it comes to things to work on in prayer. The first in verse 2 is devote. Devote yourselves to prayer. Devote means to continue, to persist in something, to be busy doing, to be steadfast, to endure. That means it has to be an intentional effort to be praying on an ongoing basis. And it takes effort to do that. It takes focus. This is the kind of, he's trying to say, if he was living in our culture, he would say, look, um, Larry, I don't want you just to be praying at bedtime and before a meal. Because that's when we tend to pray, right? We do, most of us do in our culture, right? We pray, you know, before food. Thank you, God, for this meal. You know, little kids will go, thank you, God, for this food. Um, we as uh, adults get all sophisticated. God, we bless you for the bounty that you have posed before us. But it's thank you, God, for this food. You know, we, we, do, a, we do a prayer blessing the food. Um, and we go to sleep at night. Now I lay me down to sleep, right? And we adults go, God, thank you for getting me through the day. <laughs> Uh, and we trust him with that. Um, but, but Paul is saying, look, I want you to be more intentional in your prayer. I want you to be devoted to prayer. I want prayer to be a, an important part of your life. Uh, scripture says elsewhere, Paul says, pray without ceasing. When he says pray without ceasing, there's no way any of us can pray every moment of every day. What he means by pray without ceasing is it shouldn't be some special thing you do once a day, twice a day. It should be an ongoing spirit of prayer. Because what prayer is, is a relationship with the living God. Prayer is a conversation with that living God. Prayer is an ongoing interaction with him. That should be more than just I have this time scheduled. If the only time I talked to my wife, Brandon, was before I ate... And when I went to bed at night, there's going to be a problem in our relationship, all right? My wife wants to talk to me. No, you're not on the schedule. I'll pray, you know, I talk to you when I have time to fit you into my schedule. That will not go well, would it, Hannah? No, it would not go well. So noted by your husband up there, I am sure. Um, listen, folks, we need to have a spirit of prayer of just talking to God out of the blue. How many of y'all drive driven down the road and... You see a car accident, and you just start praying for that person. Just talking to God. Just talk to him. We all think prayer has to be this long, involved. No, just talk to him. Have that relationship. God desires a relationship with us. Amen? So, so, so be devoted to prayer. He's telling them, look, you guys are doing good at your prayer meetings, but you should be praying more than once on Wednesday nights. Okay? He's saying, you're, you're praying, I get it, but, but be devoted to it. Then, being watchful. Watchful means to stay awake, to keep alert, to be at the ready. Uh, many times soldiers, when they when they're, um, could be called to battle, are put on ready alert. And ready alert simply is that, look, you can get called at any time. Be re- you're, you're, you're on go. You're on standby right now. At any moment, you're going to be sent. You're going to be deployed. You've got to go. So you've got to be on the ready. You can't be just hanging out knowing that one day I could be called. Nah, you could be called like tonight. Be on the ready. Um, That's what this refers to as Christians. When we pray, Donna, we should be on the ready. We should be looking for the return of Christ. We should be looking for those opportunities to make a difference. We should be on the ready because we're not home yet as Christians. We are serving on a foreign land. Home is not until we are in eternity with him. So here, we're, our, our, our warfare is not with what? With flesh and blood. It's in the spiritual realm. Guess where we battle that? We battle that on our knees when we pray. we got to be on the ready because we don't know when the battle is going to ensue. Am I making sense? 
<clears throat> okay? So how many of y'all think everything's going real well, then all of a sudden something happens out of blue and you feel like you were smacked over the head? Something happens and you're like, oh, I didn't see that coming. I did not see that coming. And you feel like you've been floored, you've been blindsided. That's what the enemy does. We got to be on the ready. And then we have to be thankful. Matter of fact, Paul says, in all things, give thanks. Ain't that a hard thing to do? In all things, give thanks. Prayer is not getting God. This is important. Hear me. Prayer is not getting God to comply with our needs and our wishes and our desires. That's not what prayer is. Some people use prayer thinking that somehow I'm going to convince God to then serve me. This is what I want him to do. So I'll beg and I'll plead and I'll get him to do this. It's not. It's a relationship. And prayer is meant to change someone's heart. It's not meant to change God's heart, though. It's meant to change our hearts. How many of y'all have been praying for something and after you spend time with God, God changes your heart? You're praying for something. God, I want you to do this or we want you to do this. And by the time you get done talking to him, you're thinking, oh, wow, okay, God, yeah, that's right. That's not how I should look at that. I, this, you're doing something else here. You're doing something else over here. And our hearts get changed. And it should be a heart of thankfulness, of gratitude. James 1 talks about um, um, consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you go through various trials and tribulations. How many of y'all get really joyful when there's a trial coming? Yeah, that does, that's, not the, that's not the flesh, is it, in our, in our human nature. But, Paul, but James says, be excited about that. Consider it a joy when you go through those trials, Dave, because God has a purpose for it. Romans 8 tells us, verse 28, that he works all things together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So if you're going through a trial, God's up to something. So instead of running away from the trial going, no, 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 run to the trial and say, God, what you got for me? What do you have for me? Because he's doing a work in your life through that trial. 1 Thessalonians talks about being thankful in all things. That's God's will for us. In Philippians 4, a, thanks, a thankful heart is actually the key to peace. Paul says in Philippians 4, present your requests to God, all your requests to God with thanksgiving. Wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. Did he just say... Um, pre thank God when you get your answers to prayers? No. He said, present your prayers, meaning before you get a single answer to your prayers, present your prayers with thanksgiving, your request to God. Why? Because you know you can trust him with it. So when you go to God in prayer and you say, God, my wife has cancer and I'm struggling and this is hard and she's such a good person and like this is, I can't make it without her and she's, a, and you're pouring your heart out. I get that, but, but you're, you're tossed to and fro, aren't you, in the struggle. But when you can make your prayer something like this, God, I am so blessed by my wife. The 34 years you've given me with her have been the best of my life. God, thank you. God, I would love to have a 34 more years. And God, I don't know what's ahead of us. But God, I know you're good. I know you're loving. I know you're kind. I know everything you do is for our good. So God, I want to thank you ahead of time. I want to thank you that she knows you as Savior. I want to thank you if you choose not to heal her on this side of eternity. She'll be healed with you, God. I know everything you're going to do is going to be for her good. God, man, when you start praying like that, all of a sudden, there's a peace that comes over us. Hallelujah. I want to encourage us, folks. Pray, devote, be watchful, be thankful. Then what do we pray for? Paul says pray, first of all, for us. We'll talk about those names here in a little bit. Pray for us, not just me, but pray for us. Pray for what? Notice he prays for success. But notice not success the way the world sees success. Notice he doesn't pray for, he doesn't rebuke anything. He doesn't pray for health and wealth and his own will and dominion and blessing. He prays for success in having opportunities to proclaim the gospel. Because you know when you get to heaven, all those other things you are asking God for will be met when you're in eternity. But when you're in heaven, you will no longer be able to share the gospel. Not with unsaved people. Because in heaven, unsaved people won't be there. He's saying, pray for the stuff 
that's important, guys. Pray for us to have the opportunity to proclaim the gospel. Pray that we have an open door. In Revelation 3, the church of Philadelphia, which was weak and small, had an open door. And we, many theologians, and I agree, believe that's about evangelism and missions. They had an open door. No one could shut, even though they were small and frail. Oh, Second Baptist, does that sound like something you can sink your teeth into, wrap your arms around a little bit? It doesn't matter how big you are and how big your budget is. If your heart is to win people to Jesus, he will provide whatever you need to get that done. At BOC, Bruce Outreach Center, we gave people, we told folks that, you know, we went through a 40-day fasting time. And what we did by that is we actually suspended all ministries for 40 days. That's what we did. We, we got rid of all ministries for 40 days. We stopped them. Food ministry. We stopped the um, homeschool ministry. Uh, we stopped the clothing ministry. Um, we stopped our basketball ministries. Um, we stopped everything. And we told people, the only thing we didn't stop was worship. And we encouraged people to be in church. We opened the church up every night for prayer. And so we, we told folks, look, if you work six hours a week at church, we want you to come to church and pray for six hours a week for the next 40 days. Sounds good, doesn't it? Some people work 20 hours a week. I said, okay, they come to church 20 hours a week, 20 hours a week, the next six weeks, pray. Seek the Lord. You know we lost people over that. People left the church over that because they thought we were being legalistic. I wasn't making them write time cards. I wasn't making them punch in and punch out. Um, but they were so much more willing to do things than just to be still and pray, just to seek the Lord. My friends, if you had a choice to make in your ministry here at Second Baptist, whatever ministry is your favorite ministry, if you were given a choice, no ministry, or to do the ministry or not to do the ministry and pray, if you will choose the ministry and not prayer, then we have gotten things mixed up. I knew at Bruce Outreach Center we were in trouble before, the, before the, um, the fast. I knew we had to do the fast because every time I said we were going to do a food distribution, I would have 45 volunteers. If I said I had a prayer meeting, we'd have seven. That really should have been flip-flopped. Our passion should be praying. Praying for the opportunities to share the gospel. Now, don't get me wrong, ministries are valuable and important, but let's put them where they belong, not over our relationship with Christ. Amen? What are we praying for? Be intentional, be awake, be persistent, be thankful. Proclaim the gospel clearly. Paul says to be focused in your prayers. The request is for success in the gospel. And listen, folks, let me, one of the things you may want to do how many of y'all, I'm not going to actually raise your hands, but how many of y'all have shared the gospel with somebody in the last week? I don't mean you were nice to somebody. I hope we're all being nice to people. We're going to get into that in a minute. But how many, how many folks have you shared how to be saved with this week? And that's not a put-down, folks. It really isn't. It's not. That, that's the culture we live in. We don't, we're not trained to do that. Larry, that may be one of the things your church folks may want to come together and say, hey, Pastor Joe, um, can you come down here and spend a couple weeks doing a special study with us on how to share our faith? I think that'd be pretty valuable as Christians to be able to do that. Not preach at somebody. Not saying, Hannah, this is what you must do. And No, it's loving people, building relationships. And how do you have, I love how um, uh, Mountain City Church puts it, how to have gospel conversations. Conversations that wrap around the gospel. Tommy Higley once said this, and I'll move on to my second point. I must hasten on. We spend more time in our prayer meetings praying to keep people out of heaven than we do praying to keep people out of hell. Think about it for a second. We usually pray for what? For people's health and their healing and their well-being. So if they keep living, where are they staying away from if they're saved? They're staying out of heaven, right? We're praying more to keep people out of heaven than we are praying for people to be saved to keep them out of hell. What's our focus? And folks, I haven't been at one of your prayer meetings, so none of y'all can say he's picking on us today. I, I don't know how you're praying. You may be the most fiery 
praying church for the unsaved. I don't know. I'm just saying I know my experience of being in the ministry for 31 years. Trust me, most churches are not deep in prayer for unsaved. It's for all of our other needs and concerns. So Paul says, focus on these things. All right? So that's the first thing he gives instructions. It's okay to pray for yourself, but, man, be focused, be intentional, be diligent. Endure, be of this thing, be thankful. And the prayer I want you all to pray for is pray for us to have an open door to share the gospel. Secondly, build bridges for the lost. Be wise in the way, verse 5, you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. You know, none of us knows who's going to be saved, do we? We don't know who's going to be saved. God knows who's going to be saved, who's not going to be saved. We don't know. So guess who we are to tell about Jesus? Every single person. Because we don't know what their response is going to be. In 31 years of ministry, Janie, I was so blessed for several years to be under my dad's ministry. My dad shared the gospel with anything that breathed. On his last doctor's appointment, when he had dementia and Alzheimer's, he had become like Rain Man. Literally, his front, they show me the MRI, his one frontal cortex had completely shriveled to nothing. He sat there like a blank slate, nothing. It's one of the saddest things I ever saw in my life. While he sat there, the doctor was showing me the MRI results, and it was just so sad. All of a sudden, get this, guys, all of a sudden, it was like a light switch went on in his life. All of a sudden, he looked up, and he looked looked at the doctor, and he says, Doctor, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And I was like, what? (laughs) And the doctor says, Mr. Carr, I'm Muslim. Oh, my dad, he was ready then. He says, doctor, first of all, it's not mister, it's reverend. (laughs) Secondly, I didn't ask you if you're a Muslim. I asked, do you know Jesus? Doctor looked at me for help. I went, no, you're on your own on this one. I ain't going to say not. He proceeded to share the gospel with this man, how to be born again. When he got done, guys, he looked at the doctor and he says, I have told you what I was told to tell you. Now you do with it what you will. And he went right back to nothing. That's powerful, folks. That's, that's, that's the heart of a man that this needs people to, to know Jesus. He didn't know if that man would ever be saved. He doesn't know. But he's going to tell anybody he can about who Jesus is. Until Christ returns, we are to tell as many people as possible how one is saved. Look, and doing that is simply this. Janie, it's one beggar telling another beggar where he can find food. Because we're all beggars. We're all sinners. We all fall short. None of us deserve the grace of God. None of us deserve to go to heaven. We all deserve separation. We all deserve to go to hell. We all deserve that. And we were starving to death spiritually. We were dead in our trespasses. God brought us to life through the power of the Spirit and the blood of the Lamb. And when he brought us to life, he then nourishes us and feeds us. And when we go tell someone else, they're in the same state we were. It's just one beggar telling another beggar where they can go get some food. That's Jesus, folks. That's the gospel. And so it's important we communicate that to people. So what does that have to do with these verses? It says here, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Folks, we have to communicate the gospel without outsiders or unsaved people. And communication is kind of important, isn't it? Come on, isn't communication important? All right, all right I can prove communication is important. Okay, you ready? Ready? Larry, you go home today. And you say, Donna, I love you. Okay. Donna looks at you and goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love you too. Or she goes, yeah, 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 I love you too. Yeah, I was like, nope, that's not going to happen. 
Look, communication involves more than just one person speaking. It's how someone hears you, how they perceive. It's your body language. It's, it's, it's your intonation, your voice, how you say it. Come on, am I right? Like, I'll talk to my wife, and I'm like, honey, you understand what I'm saying? She's like, uh-huh, and I know she's not listening to a word I'm saying. She goes, uh-huh. I'm like, so what did I just say, honey? She looks at me, she goes, I love you too. <laughs> No, it's not what I was saying, but I do love you. Communication is very complicated. So understand, as Christians, we have to be really in tune to how we communicate with the world. Because faith comes by hearing. And if they can't hear us because of all the interference and how we're saying things and what's going on in the world, they ain't going to be able to process it. Does that make sense? So it's important as believers that we are cautious in how we communicate. So communication and sharing the gospel. Let's look real quick here at what the text tells us. First, ask God for that wisdom. That's the first thing. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Be wise. James 1 says, if any of you lack wisdom, ask God for it, and he'll give generously. So God, I don't know how to share my faith with this person, but I know you want me to. So give me wisdom, God. Open the doors. Help me to see it. Ask him for that. You're talking his language when you ask him to help you share your faith with somebody. Then second, see and seize every opportunity. Verse 5, make the most of every opportunity. It's wisdom to see the door and then boldness to go through it, right? Have you, have you all, I've, I've been through this. That's why I always take someone with me if I can when I go minister to somebody to share the gospel. Because I'll walk into a room and I'll have the opportunity to share the gospel. But there's lots of things going against me at that time. So you know how easy it is just to go... Yeah, okay, I'll do it next time. Any y'all ever done that? Yeah, see, when I take someone with me, like if I take Brandon with me, and we go meet somebody and minister to him, and I'm like tempted to, like, I won't share my faith now. I'm like, oh my word, I've got a brother sitting with me, and I'm training him, and he's going to be doing what I do. Not to mention, he'll go home and tell Kay I didn't share the gospel. Then Kay will be after me about that. And, you know, so I'm going to to have to share the gospel. I'm going to have to because i got accountability now. Amen? Then you share the gospel, and the person you thought would never get saved gets saved. And you're like, oh, my word, I should have been faithful a lot sooner. Oh, my friend, seize the opportunity. And then third, talk right. Look at verse 5. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Be wise. Make the most of every opportunity. Don't let anything go by. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. In other words, talk right. Be kind. Be gracious. Grace isn't just saving grace. Grace is being kind to someone who may not even deserve it. Be great. Be full of grace. Show people grace. And when they need, when you think they deserve, I told you so, don't do that. That's showing mercy. You know, that's difference between grace and mercy. They're both important. Grace is giving to someone something good they do not deserve. Like we get heaven from the less grace, salvation. Mercy is withholding something that someone deserves. So that's hell that we deserve, that God withholds. That's his mercy. Okay? There's grace and there's mercy. Live your life with grace and with mercy. Having your speech be seasoned for flavor and to preserve. You know, we were, we had um, somebody, and I'll, I'll, I'll move on here. I got two illustrations. I'm going to share one of them with you. But um, we had somebody knock at my door, at our door last month. And then on, on our front door, and I opened the door, and I couldn't place her at first. You ever have somebody come by, and you're like, you have a hard time, like, you, know, you see somebody, and they know you, but you're like, I know you, but I'm not, you know. And as she talked, I figured it out, okay? She gave me enough clues, thank the Lord, right? Um, and she's sitting, and she's standing there, she's talking to me. She says, um, Pastor Stephan, she's like, my uh, grandma has been put into hospice. She's dying, and we don't have a pastor. Um would you go minister to her and to my family? And, of course, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, because that's making the most of every opportunity. But I said to her, why did you come to, like, why did you come to us? And she ended up, she was one of our neighbors from across the street. And 
you know, there's been issues there, like he's a canine officer, and there's lots of dogs, and there's some couple people in the community that aren't so nice, and, you know, they've had some hard times, but they've had a couple of run-ins with us, with their dogs, and with a kid riding his bike into our car, and all that kind of stuff, and, 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 and they've come, and they've been on, we've had, I think, a good, we've been kind to every step of the way, being kind, it's okay, I made sure the kid was okay. She said, because I think you're the only person on our block who likes us. And you really seem like a nice person. So I felt comfortable coming to ask you. Be nice to everybody. I know that doesn't sound like a fire and brimstone preach and... uh, Okay, if I got to do it, then I'll do it. Be nice to everybody. <laughs> be kind. Christians should be the kindest people on this planet because if it were not for the kindness of Christ, we'd be lost. Be kind. That doesn't mean you have to approve of everybody's behavior. It doesn't mean you have to go along. with that's not, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying be nice. Be kind. Because at one point in time, there's going to come a need, and they're going to need somebody and they're not going to go to you. I still remember on the flip side, y'all think I'm praising myself for being nice. There was another time, it was just the opposite, Hannah. JoJo was only like 12 years old playing basketball, Tri-Towns League in, in, Piedmont, in, in the um, Bloomington area, Westernport, Piedmont. She's playing basketball. I just got done having knee surgery, right? And so I'm highly medicated. And when I'm on pain medicine, I become the world's biggest grump. Yeah, I become like just really snippy. And I'm sitting there, and I think the referee stunk that night. And he was messing it up big time because my daughter didn't do one thing wrong during the game. And he had it out for her, and I was letting him have it during the game, right? I get out into the car, and my daughter sits next to me. Oh, my. She says, Dad, I love you. But if Greg, the referee needed to know how to be saved tonight. After what you just did, would he listen to a word you had to say? Be kind. Because Christians have bigger fish to fry than just getting my way right now. Amen? All right. So communicate the gospel. Be intentional. Be persistent, alert, with thanksgiving. Pray for success and opportunity to share the gospel. Nothing wrong with praying for yourself, but what's the focus of your prayers? And build bridges to the lost. Communication. Ask God for wisdom. Take every opportunity and be kind. Isn't that the gospel anyway? How Christ was kind to us? And if kindness is not the gospel, it's definitely the bridge upon which you can cross to share the gospel with someone. Lastly, bless yourself with Christian friends. I won't read all these verses, but I'll give you some highlights. This is not a command from Paul. He doesn't say, thou shalt bless yourself with friends. But it sure looks pretty clear that he had a lot of friends, a lot of Christian friends. These verses demonstrate his blessing of Christian friends. Now, Christian friends, Christian does not mean church going. Not everybody goes to church as a Christian. And not everybody in church will be a a good Christian. Some people go to church and they go through the motions. They're not going to be your best friend. And also, a friend is not somebody you just say hi to. It's not like on Facebook. Let me me just give you a warning. If you have 2,000 friends on Facebook, I promise you, you do not have 2,000 friends. I just want you to know that, okay? Uh, You have people that know your name, and that's it. I'm talking about folks that are born again, saved, love the Lord, and are willing to walk with you. Have Christian friends. Doesn't mean you don't have friends from outside who aren't saved because you got to be light and salt. But the people you lean on, your inner circle, who you get advice from, who help you walk day to day, they need to be born again believers who love you and you love them. You need to be surrounded by Christian friends. Hence why it's important to be in church because that offers the best way to find Christian friends. So look at some of these people real quick Tychicus. Say that five times. Tychicus. Actually sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? Uh, (laughs) I tease my daughter when she has a boy. I want her to name it Methuselah Zerubbabel. She just rolls her eyes at me. So now I'm going to ask her to name him um, Tychicus Onesimus. We'll see if that goes over. Probably no better, right? Um, But notice that 
um, Tychicus was actually Paul's quote-unquote partner in crime, partner in ministry. He traveled with Paul. Paul used him as his representative. We know from Scripture, from Acts 29, Ephesians, 2 Timothy, and Titus, that Tychicus, you're going to find him listed. And Tychicus' role was to troubleshoot problems in churches. So when Paul went and founded a church and then went 200 miles over here, and he found out there was issues back here, he would send Tychicus back as his ambassador, his representative, to troubleshoot issues. That's how dependable he was. And notice who he chose to be that person, to be the one he trusted. Notice how he is described. He's described as dear brother. He is described as faithful minister and fellow servant. Notice he is not called a great preacher, a great evangelist, a great soul winner, a great miracle worker. He is simply called a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant. Ain't that beautiful? That's Tychicus. Do you have a Tychicus in your life? Someone who maybe is not all that flashy. He's not going to get up and preach a sermon. Not going to be the one in front of everybody. But man, they're your go-to person. They're dear and precious and faithful. And they serve right alongside of you. Love the Lord. Man, that's a, that's a great person to have. Then there's Onesimus. Onesimus is called a faithful and dear brother. Now, this is important. Onesimus is the slave who's being sent back. The book of Philemon is written over. Onesimus was beaten by Philemon and treated harshly. He ran away. Paul found him. He found Paul. Paul led him to Christ. This slave, this slave became a born-again Christian. And now, in the, if you read the book of Philemon, which is actually attributed to being one of the, most ma- the, the, one of the major reasons for the, the downfall of slavery, because here Paul refers to a slave, to the slave owner, as he is now no longer your possession. He is our brother. Woo! Folks, you want social justice? You just give them Jesus. Jesus don't let people be unjust if you're truly saved, if you're truly born again. He's like, this man is our brother. And so he went back. What a powerful death blow to slavery, and what an incredible um, testimony to the gospel. Notice Aristarchus, and Aristarchus was a fellow prisoner with Paul, and and Jesus, who's called Justice, this is the only time we hear him mentioned in Scripture. We don't know a whole lot about him, but we do see Mark. Mark here, remember, he had a history with Paul. Mark went with Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey. On that journey, Mark got homesick. Mark, Mark was a youngin. He was a young guy. He got homesick. He went home. Paul thought he was abandoned, that Mark abandoned his post. Paul's like, no. So then when it came time to come again to another mission trip, Mark said, I want to go again. Paul said, no, he can't come. He's already proved he can't do it. He can't take the heat. He can't stand it. It was too much for him. We need people we can depend on. Barnabas says, no, no, no. I know him. He's my cousin. He's a good man. He needs a second chance. Isn't that what the gospel is all about? It's about the second chance. And so here Paul and Barnabas had a break and a fracture. And Paul went with Silas, and then Barnabas went with Mark. Now fast forward a number of years. As Paul is winding down his ministry and getting ready to die, he's in prison. Who's with him? Mark. Ain't that beautiful? The reconciliation that happens in the gospel. Folks, don't write anybody off. Somebody may have treated you a certain way or they may have let you down. But trust me, years from now, God may get a hold of them further and they may become your best friend in the ministry. Don't give up on people. God doesn't give up on us. He wrote the Gospel of Mark, and he was a close friend of Peter's. <laughs> Pretty cool stuff. And then you have Epaphras. He's the founder of the church at Colossae. He was in jail with Paul, and he was involved with intercessory prayer. He said he wrestled in prayer so the church would stand firm, mature, and fully assured. Fully assured. Doesn't that sound great? Fully assured. And there's Luke and Demas. Demas was, excuse the expression, was the one dud in this list. Uh, D- Demas later has said that he loved the world in 2 Timothy. He loved the world more, so he left them. Um, but there's Luke. Luke was a doctor, 
a fellow worker was with, with Paul at the end of his life in 2 Timothy. He wrote the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Acts. Luke, in essence, wrote one quarter of the New Testament. And he was a Gentile. How cool is that? And then finally, I just wanted to, those are his friends. What a friends list, right? Who are your friends? Who are the ones you lean on? Uh, but then he sends a message in verse 17. He says to Archippus, See to it that you complete the ministry you received in the Lord. My friends, when God calls you to ministry, you better complete what he sent you to do. And I believe every single Christian has been given a ministry. No, it may not be pastoring a church. I get that. We always, we always refer to that as the ministry, don't we? Going into the ministry. That means you're going to be a pastor. Well, yeah, that's how we look at it professionally. But, Larry, do you know as a deacon in this church and trying to serve people in this church, definitely you're not the pastor. You made that really clear to me the first time we talked. <laughs> I ain't no pastor. I didn't want to be. By the way, he didn't say ain't no. He has much better grammar than that. That was my grammar. Um, but you know that's your ministry right now. Um, how many here have grandkids? Yeah. Guess what? How many, now, don't raise your hand on this one. How many of y'all have grandkids that maybe your kids, you wish they would have them being raised in the church a little more, or in the Lord a little more, but they're just not there? Well, guess what? Um, those grandchildren are your ministry. We all got a ministry. Make sure you complete it. Be faithful to the day God calls you home. So our sermon come, our con series comes to a conclusion. There's a supremacy of Christ. He's the head of the church, impacting the body. All we do is to be done for him and to him, towards him. So that changes our relationship, our priorities, our goals in life. So friends, as we conclude, can I encourage you all to become a people of prayer? Be intentional. Be persistent. Be awake. Be alert. Be thankful. Look what you're asking for. And let's build bridges to the lost. If he is supreme and we love him, then by extension, we are going to grow to obey him. So if we love and obey him, we are going to make disciples because that was his last words to his disciples. Go be my witnesses. Go make disciples. If you make that decision, I'm sorry, to make disciples, we have to build bridges to the lost. We've got to have relationships with lost people. We've got to be able to share the gospel. Look, and, and, and sometimes the problem with the church is we're too organizationally based. We're not organically based. We're organizational. So we say, no, wait a minute. I don't have, I can't, I can't share the gospel with that family. If they bring their three kids with them, there's nothing here for the kids. You know what that says? That says you're counting on the organization of the church to have something for, your, for those kids. No, if you're disciple making, then guess what? You're going to ask that family with their three kids to sit with you in church. You're going to provide some ministry for them. Now, maybe the church grows and the church can do more, but don't wait until the church is so big it can do everything for you and then you just bring people to church and they get saved. You and I are meant to build the relationships. You and I are meant to share the gospel. You and I are meant to make disciples. He never said Second Baptist Church as an organization go into all the world and make disciples. He said members of Second Baptist, born again, blood-bought believers, disciples, you go make disciples. The church grows because the people grow. The people don't grow because the church grows. Do y'all hear that? Don't base your spiritual health on how healthy your church is. Your spirit, the spiritual health of your church is contingent on how healthy spiritually you and I are. Whew. Let's be blessed by and surrounded by Christian friends. So I'll close with this, just in case, just in case. Just in case there's someone here who doesn't know Jesus. Just in case. You never know. So this is what I'm going to ask you to do. Church, second, I'm about to share the gospel real quickly. This is when most people zip their Bibles up and get ready to sing. Don't do that. You're the church. We've just been exhorted to what? To pray. Pray for what? For opportunity to share the gospel. For people to be safe. So I'm about to share the gospel. So church, you know what you should be doing right now? You should be praying right now for that one person to be attentive to hear the gospel. Does that make sense? 
All right? This is important now, guys. This is is application now, okay? Are we a praying church? Do we want people saved? Yes, okay. Pastor Stefan is about to share the gospel. There could be one person in this church not saved. So guess what? I'm going to go to praying. So you start praying in your spirits right now. Pray to the Lord. And then I'm going to try to build a bridge with an unsaved person. And I want to tell you today that we're all sinners. And we all deserve to go to hell. Every one of us. There ain't nobody better than anyone else. But Jesus loved us so much that he doesn't want us to go to hell. He wants us to be with him. The problem is he can't let sin in his presence. So we got to deal with the sin issue. And he did it by dying on the cross for us. We're about to go to the Lord's Supper. He was crucified for us. And all those who call upon him will be saved. Today, my friends, if you, know, you don't know for sure when you stand before God that you'll be in heaven, today's the day you need to hear his voice. You need to say, Lord Jesus, you need to respond to him. You need to cry out to him. I don't care what the prayer sounds like, but it's, and that's says, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I can't do this. God, I need you to save me. I want you to forgive me, God. I want to repent. I want to turn away from trusting me. I want to trust you today. Would you do that? Just pray to him. Talk to him. There ain't no magic words. He knows your heart. One of the best sinner's prayers I ever heard was at a man at BOC at the altar. I went to pray with him. I was going to lead him to Christ. I was going to lead him down the road, um, Brandon. I was going to pray the greatest sinner's prayer in all the history of sinner's prayer. I was going to go up and pray with him. I got up there, and all I heard that man, big burly man, bawling like a baby, saying, Save me, Jesus. Save me, Jesus. Just save me, Jesus. I'm thinking to myself, okay, he's got the sinner's prayer down. Call on him, my friends. And if today you make that decision to trust Jesus, my friends, I promise you, he won't ignore your prayer. He will come in and he will save you. And his Holy Spirit will come and dwell in you. And you don't need to feel any. You don't need to go, I'm not not feeling any. It's not about feeling. It's about obedience, just trusting him today. And his spirit will move in your life. Put yourself in this church and to grow and to become strong in your faith. You never know, my friends. I don't know what happened today. But is it possible in the spiritual realm, y'all just prayed and someone just got saved? I don't know. What I know is this. We obeyed the Lord. And when you take care of God's business, he always takes care of yours. God bless you, Second Baptist. Be a church of prayer. And watch what he does for his glory. God bless this precious church now. As we conclude with our song and our invitation to go into the Lord's Supper, I pray, Lord, that we would hear your Holy Spirit speak to us. Lord, if there's someone here in this room that's never repented, never trusted you, Lord, let this be the day they do that, God. And then let them never be the same again because of who you are in Jesus' name.